I want to introduce you to a wonderful man, uh, Vigo Olson. Dr. Olson spent most of his life as a missionary surgeon in Bangladesh. He ran a hospital for 50 years, and, and then he retired. And so in his 80s when he retired, uh, he spent his free time uh, translating the Bible into a, uh, an entirely new translation geared for South Asian Muslims. He lived to be 95 years old, passing away in January of 2022. Now, the the Muslim and tribal cultures of Bangladesh are very strongly opposed to Christianity. However, Dr. Olson became so respected there that he was consulted by every major political figure in the country's history. In the 40-plus years of Bangladesh's history, every single one had tea with him. In fact, they made a special visa for him, visa number 001, to put inside his U.S. passport. Why was Dr. Olson so honored and successful? Here's what the good doctor said. He said his secret was to live by three principles, salvation, surrender, and service. Uh, In your bulletin, if you'll open it up there, you'll see a wonderful summary of these principles. It's a quote from Dr. Olson's best-selling book, Dakhtar II. Uh, Dakhtar, by the way, is doctor in Bangladeshi. Um, He wrote uh, wrote two books, Dakhtar I, uh, was about his, uh, him and his wife uh, meeting in medical school, becoming believers in Jesus Christ, making the decision to go on the mission field. Um, by the way, that was a number one, New York Times number one best-selling book uh, around the world. And then he wrote Dr. Two about all of their work in Bangladesh. If you're online with us, we're thrilled to be with you. Please, um, please go to the link there and you'll see all the notes there. And, and look at what he says in Dr. Two. All these great life experiences came to us because of three simple words, salvation, surrender, and service. The day Jonah and I placed our faith in Christ the Lord was the day of our salvation, the point in time when we received forgiveness and life everlasting. Months later, in an act of surrender, we placed our lives in the Father's hands so that He could use them for good and spiritual purposes. Then guidance came that our service would be to love, heal, and teach the people of a land we now call Bangladesh. I I want to read you some more beyond that of how he describes these three words. I think this is very important for understanding of the text we're going to go to today. He says, to me, the best illustration of this threefold rule of life is that razor-sharp knife-like instrument, the surgeon's scalpel. My scalpel was not always a shining stainless steel precision instrument. Once, it was a lowly brown, dirty, misshapen piece of iron ore buried in a hillside. One day, however, a miner dug it out rescued it, saved it from that hillside for a more useful purpose. Similarly, Christ the Lord becomes Savior of all who put their faith in Him. And the salvation He provided became ours the instant we believed this good news message and personally received Him by faith. All God's people said? He goes on. What about surrender? That's His second word. Listen, my scalpel is the ultimate picture of surrender. Although I have picked it up thousands of times, it has never once cut north when I told it to cut south. It has never varied one hair's breadth from what I told it to do. According to the Scriptures, that is to be our stance too. We're told in Romans to surrender yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. And third, what is the purpose of the scalpel? It was created to be used by a caring surgeon to help the sick and injured in their agony and distress and sometimes to save their lives. Doesn't that perfectly picture what our service should be? We're to be instruments in the master's hand who show his love to others and who aid them in their pain, confusion, grief, and in some instances, help them gain new life. Close quote. The surgeon's scalpel illustrates salvation, surrender, and service. And that picture provides a perfect introduction to Joshua chapter 8, where you and I are learning today. Joshua 7 and 8 can, can best be understood, I think, in light of God's role as our great physician. Uh, Let me give you a quick review. In in chapter 7, the Lord has to excise a a tumor, a tumor of wickedness out of Israel. Unbeatable Israel, whose huge armies were supposed to be completely uh, unconquerable because of the favor of God, they have been whipped by a little tiny outpost town of about 12,000 people. The soldiers of Ai have defeated the Israelites, sent them running off in defeat. God had removed His blessing because this this cancer of evil in a family named Achan um, was was causing Israel to sin. So Achan was excised. I know, but it's okay. It worked out because Achan was excised. And because that evil is removed from them, Israel is saved from God's wrath. That's chapter 7. Then in chapter 8, 
newly surgically repaired Israel gets to join in their, in their rehab process. They're sent back to I, which is their physical therapy. And, and there Israel learns to flex their muscles and work their lives out the way God had intended. That's the context. Now, let's watch how it plays out. Go to chapter 8, if you would. Go to Joshua chapter 8, and let's pick it up in verse 1. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid or discouraged. Take all the troops with you and go attack I. Look. I've handed over to you the king of Ai, his people, city, and land. Treat Ai and its king as you did Jericho and its king, except that you may plunder its spoil and livestock for yourselves. God gives a renewed beginning here. First thing, Joshua is granted the most amazing thing in life, divine encouragement. As we started chapter 8, Joshua and Israel are feeling really defeated. They are ruined because of this town of Ai. This, is their very, this generation has never known defeat. It's their first defeat. By the way, the name I means ruin, and that's exactly how they feel. They feel ruined. And in that situation, in their despair, the Lord says three things to Joshua and Israel. Number one, the people are saved. Therefore, don't be afraid. Number two, I am with you. Do you see that in the text? Because God is with you, you can surrender to his leadership wonderfully. Amazingly, God has not rejected them because of their previous sin. He's still with them. They just need to get back to following his lead. And number three, God is guiding through his word. Now is not the time to despair or, or panic. In fact, the tone of chapter 8 is very, is very fun. It's very excited and fast-paced. Josh, Joshua's telling us this awesome story of adventure. You know what he's doing? He's showing us a scar. He's saying, look, dude, this is a scar. I got an eye. This is a really big one. This is, a, he's, th this is a sign of healing. The scar is not a bad thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's a sign that the great physician has healed him, right? There's divine encouragement here from the great physician's scalpel. Israel is saved for surrender and service. God is still going to be with them. He's still going to use them. That is very encouraging. And it's an encouragement that some of us may need today. Do you, do you need that kind of, of edification? You know, some of us here are, are saved we're believers in Jesus, but we have faced defeat. We have run. We've got scars because we, we stopped following the Lord's lead. In that situation, it's very important that we hear God's word again. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Get back in the fight. All God's people said? Amen. Amen. Israel's granted divine encouragement and sure victory. Uh, verse 1. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid or discouraged. Take all the troops with you and go attack Ai. Look, I've handed over to you the king of Ai, his people, city, and land. Remember, Israel was operating under a conditional covenant, a bilateral covenant with God. Um, uh, slide up to just chapter 7. You'll see this mentioned, verses 10 and 11 of chapter 7. The Lord then said to Joshua in chapter 7, 10, stand up. Why have you fallen face down? Israel sinned. They violated my covenant that I appointed for them. They've taken some of what was set apart. They have stolen, deceived, and put those things with their own belongings. God, God remained faithful to his covenant promise while Israel did not. And yet, in a demonstration of amazing grace and mercy, God forgives Israel's trespass in that bilateral covenant and now allows Israel to move forward. There are no qualifications here. Go back to chapter 8, verse 1. Does it say, if you're good, you'll be victorious? Is that what it says? Yes or no? No, please say no. No, the Lord grants Joshua a clear look ahead, and he says, you will win. Therefore, get up and go. 7.10, God told Joshua, stand up. Quit playing the victim. Stop whining over what you suppose was done to you, and get busy doing what you have been given to do. When my kids were really young, a very wicked friend of ours gave us a video called Little Golden Book Land. And my kids loved it. And the songs are very catchy. And I heard them many thousands of times. And now, finally, all these years later, I get to inflict it on you. Because <laughs> misery loves company. In all sincerity, there's one song in there. And every time I heard this song, which again was thousands of times, every time I heard this song, I thought of Joshua 7 and 8. You, you'll see why. It, it, the song is, get up and go. Gird the, gird the loins of your ears. Here you go. Get up and go. Get up and go. Don't be afraid. Go on with the show. Get up and go. Get up and go. You gotta laugh. 
Oh, that is the height of animation right there. Everybody. One of the most obnoxiously head sticking songs of all time. But it fits, doesn't it? I mean, it, it? God sings to Joshua don't be afraid, you, you're going to win. Stop whining and get up and go. Third part of this new beginning is Israel's granted new blessings. Look in your text. They, they get to keep the goodies this time. Do you see that? that? This is not like Jericho. Jericho was the first fruits of the conquest of Canaan. That was a sacrifice dedicated to the Lord. This time, Israel gets to keep the riches from their victory. And this, to me, this may be the most shocking aspect in the entire passage. Remember, this is, a, this is a bilateral covenant. This is not a unilateral covenant of grace. This is a two-way conditional covenant. Israel has violated that covenant. Therefore, according to all contractual laws, they no longer have any right to the 90% that God was going to give them. And yet, God graciously grants them blessings as part of their restoration. And there's a, and there's a beautiful parallel in, in our experience as Christians. When we sin... There are real and righteous consequences, right? In, in, in God's light, I want you to look carefully at this photo. Look carefully here. In God's light, any evil we try to do to others reflects back on us as darkness, right? That's what it does. However, God marvelously, graciously allows those who trust Him to receive new blessings that we don't deserve. Despite our dark thoughts and deeds, we can be forgiven in Jesus and experience His light. Colossians uh, chapter 1 says, it gives a beautiful statement about this. Join me on the underlined parts of verses uh, 11 through 14. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance. Do, do we deserve that inheritance? No. We deserve nothing. He, he's enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to His people who live in the light. For He has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His dear Son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Amen. Now, look to the right side of our notes where we state that God gives a new strategy. That strategy is found in verses 2 through 13. This is brilliant. All right, let's read it. Set an ambush behind the city. So Joshua and all the troops set out to attack Ai. Joshua selected 30,000 of his best soldiers and sent them out at night. He commanded them, pay attention. Lie in ambush behind the city, not too far from it, and all of you be ready. Then I and all the people who are with me will approach the city. When they come out against us, as they did the first time, we will flee from them. They will come after us until we've drawn them away from the city, for they will say, they're fleeing from us as before. <laughs> and that's exactly how they said it. Um, while we're fleeing from them, you're to come out of your ambush and seize the city. The Lord your God will hand it over to you. After taking the city, set it on fire. Follow the Lord's command. See that you do as I have ordered you. So Joshua sent them out, and they went to the ambush site and waited between Bethel and Ai to the west of Ai, but he spent the night with the troops. Joshua started early the next morning and mobilized them. Then he and the elders of Israel led the troops to Ai. All those who were with him went up and approached the city, arriving opposite Ai and camped to the north of it with a valley between them and the city. Now, Joshua had taken about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai. That's, ambush there is a really rough translation. It's it may not be best, very difficult word to get into English, uh, between Bethel and Ai to the west of the city. The troops were stationed in this way, the main camp to the north of the city and its rear guard to the west of the city. And that night, Joshua went into the valley. Okay, here's the deal. Israel here is using a military strategy that, that centuries later will be called feigned retreat. Uh, Joshua and others must have made this famous because 900 years later, we have the next mention of this in literature. The Chinese general Sun Tzu said, do not pursue an enemy who simulates flight. 
Uh, the Spartans used this technique to great effect at Thermopylae. Um, the uh, Hannibal used it twice against different Roman armies. Uh, William the Conqueror used the feigned retreat twice in the same battle, and it worked both times at Hastings, and is why he conquered England. It, it works like this. You appear to retreat in the face of an enemy. The enemy doesn't know that you have ambushers either out of sight to the sides or behind or all the above, and as the enemy follows you in retreat, you spring the trap and the enemy gets destroyed inside your nifty little trap that you drew them into. One of the greatest things about coaching football was getting to use this technique. It was so fun. Let me show you. Here's a classic trap block in football. Um, my, my, I would call this play, my, my tackle blocks the middle linebacker, my guard blocks their guard, my tight end blocks their end, and we leave their defensive tackle all alone. Defensive tackles... Um, they, they tend to be a very aggressive, excitable group of human beings anyway, um, and, and especially after they've had a sack. Uh, those of you who don't know American football, a sack is where the defense tackles uh, our quarterback behind the line. And so what I would do is I would wait until our quarterback had been sacked by their defensive tackle once in the game, because after that, defensive tackles have no mind. They're just blood, 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 blood. They're all excited, right? So, so they're just, they smell blood. They're so tickled. So once they tacked our quarterback, a couple plays later, I would call this, and we leave this tackle all alone. He thinks it's a blown assignment, and he comes running through. <laughs> I got him, I got him. And then our guard, <laughs> notice the guard right here, had, he wasn't blocking anybody. That's because he takes two steps back and goes, wham, and he puts his helmet right in the ear hole of that tackle who doesn't see him at all and lays him out, and it's just so fun. That is, that is the joy of life, all right? That's the fun Joshua gets to have here in chapter 8. Let me, let me walk you through a, a quick, simple little map. I've got another map I'll show you later, but... But what you've got here is the night before, Joshua sent this 30,000-person force up the, the Wadi Suwaini, uh, and they go up here, and they camp. We don't know exactly where. Uh, and I have another map that will show you how steep these hills are, but they're in the backside of the steep hills to the southwest of Bethel and Ai. The main force comes up here. They make sure they go out in front and let Ai see them, right? And, and then they camp for the night, and then they send 5,000 men up here. And it's really not an ambush. It's more of a screw screening force. Uh, this is very important. And, and they were certainly seen by the people of Bethel. You're going to find out later that Bethel goes and fights with I. Sorry, spoiler. And, um, and when these two cities go like that, these forces are here for one reason, to make sure that Joshua doesn't get flanked by anybody coming out of Bethel. It's not any fun to set an ambush and then get ambushed yourself, right? So the, these guys are there to protect his flank. And then Joshua, after they're seen, he starts retreating down into the Wadi Makuk. He goes back down into the lowlands, which is absurd tactics. He's giving up the high ground and putting himself in, in a low spot. And, and the, the warlord of Ai is like, oh, they're scared of us again. They're running like babies that they are. He's the, he's the left tackle. He, he's so excited and he comes running out. Ha, 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 ha. It's marvelous. Feigned retreat. All right, brilliant stuff. Now, you may have noticed the second part of God's new strategy is Israel takes the entire army this time. God sends a bunch of soldiers here for the same reason that years later he would send only a few with Gideon in, in your book of Judges. The reason is people must understand the victory comes from the Lord. Back in Joshua chapter 7, Israel tried to win with just a few thousand troops. In, in Judges, Gideon at first has this great army. But in each case, God says, let's, let's be counterintuitive here. Instead of trusting your few, Josh, or instead of trusting your many, Gideon, let, let's, let's trust the Lord. That way, there's no boasting in people or in their size-related plan. Instead, people learn to look to the Lord and boast only in Him. It's really telling to relate this idea to our own mission. You and I are meant to do the Great Commission, to spread the great news of Jesus in this time and place. Is there anything in that Great Commission, those of you who know it, as it's stated throughout the, the New Testament, is there anything in that Great Commission about size or strength? Is there? Yes or no? No, there most certainly is not. There's nothing about size or strength having anything to do with a church fulfilling its mission. No church is too small or too big if it remains on mission. And the same is true for individual Christians. The point isn't your personal power or your measurable greatness. The point is whether or not you will trust the Lord in whom there is strength, to whom the battle belongs. God has called you and your church to reach the world with the good news of Jesus Christ. So get up and go. 
little kiddo came up to me after the first service. Sweet little girl handed me this note. Can you? I don't know if you can bring a camera in here. It's a train with the puppy on it, and it says, get up and go. Isn't that awesome? I know her parents are going to be thrilled that she has that song in her head now. <clears throat> Trust the Lord and use whatever means you have to get in the battle. It's not about the size of your army that matters. It's the size of your God. One final new note on this, this new strategy. Israel shows great discipline here. Have you ever thought about how hard it is to stay the course, to stay quiet and still when you're setting an ambush? In the days, especially before wireless communication, signals were always a great concern. And it is very hard when you keep waiting for a long period of time. Given that, it's, it's possible that these thousands of soldiers, these 30,000 soldiers were supernaturally hidden by God. Uh, the text doesn't say that. Usually the text says when there is something supernatural happening. So, so it may have just been that they had a very long night of waiting. How many of you as a kid ever set yourself up waiting to jump out and frighten someone? Who did this as a child? What is wrong with the rest of you? Okay. Um, I, I remember hiding behind a door. My mom had just finished doing the laundry and she was going to walk in the door with this basket full of newly folded laundry. And it's so hard to keep from giggling because it is so exciting to think about it. I'm going to jump out and she's going to go, ah! And clothes are going to go everywhere. And it is worth having, because I knew what she'd make me do. You, you fold all those clothes and it was worth it to watch her go, ah! And you totally lose her cool, right? That's the greatest thing in the world. And I remember one time waiting, kind of cramped behind the door, and I'm waiting and waiting, and, and I'm, so, I'm trying not to giggle, I'm trying to stay alert, I'm trying to be ready, so when she walks in, I don't miss her. And then I hear her talking on the phone to her friend, forever. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then she goes into the kitchen and starts putting around in the kitchen. I'm like, what is wrong with you? The clothes, you leave the clothes. Is it easy to stay alert when that happens? No, it is not. It's very, it's very difficult. And, and, and this speaks to this speaks to the, the 30,000 soldiers here. I mean, multiply my experience times 30,000. Apparently, each one of these guys is showing the kind of resolve that escaped me as a child. And it's really remarkable. It tells us that these men were disciplined. And it displays great trust in Joshua, their commander, and great trust in God's word. They're doing what God says, even if it's tense, even if it's tiring. Is that true of us? I wonder. It seems that you and I rationalize our disobedience with great facility. When God instructs me to wait, to trust Him and to be alert, to be ready, which He says many times to us in the New Testament, I don't think we always wait with the discipline of Israel at eye. In, in your marriage where you feel bored, in, in that new skill that you're learning, but it's just taking so long, the process is so slow, in that promise from the Lord that is clearly a scriptural promise but you're just waiting and waiting for it. Are you staying alert? Don't you think we'd be better soldiers of the Lord if we learned to wait with discipline? Israel waits on the Lord, and God gives them new victory. Go to verse 14. When the king of Ai saw the Israelites, the men of the city hurried and went out early in the morning so that he and all his people could engage Israel in the battle at a suitable place facing the Arabah. Mm. Arabah is a really old-fashioned term. It was old-fashioned even when this was written for uh, what we today call the Great Rift Valley. It's, it's the great earthquake-prone tectonic plate area that runs from, uh, from far northwestern Asia all the way down through the Middle East and into Africa. The, the Jordan River is right in the center of it. So he wants to fight them facing toward the Jordan River. What it's telling you is he wants the high ground, which is very wise. So he rushes out to get the high ground. <laughs> but he did not know that there was an ambush waiting for him behind the city. Joshua and all Israel pretended to be beaten back by them and fled toward the wilderness. That's back toward Gibeon. Then all the troops of Ai were summoned to pursue them, and they pursued Joshua and were drawn away from the city. Not a man was left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel, leaving the city exposed while they pursued Israel. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Hold out the javelin in your hand toward I, for I will hand the city over to you. So Joshua held out his javelin toward it. When he held out his hand, the men in ambush rose quickly from their position. They ran, entered the city, captured it, and immediately set it on fire. The men of I turned and looked back, and smoke from the city was rising to the sky. They could not escape in any direction, and the troops who had fled to the wilderness now became the pursuers. When Joshua and all Israel saw that the men in ambush had captured the city and that smoke was rising from it, they turned back and struck down the men of I. 
Then men in ambush came out of the city against them, and the men of Ai were trapped between the Israelite forces, some on one side, some on the other. They struck them down until no survivor or fugitive remained. But they captured the king of Ai alive and brought him to Joshua. When Israel had finished killing everyone living in Ai who had pursued them into the open country, and when every last one of them had fallen by the sword, all Israel returned to Ai and struck it down with a sword. The total of those who fell that day, both men and women, was 12,000, all the people of Ai. Joshua did not draw back his hand that was holding the javelin until all the inhabitants of Ai were completely destroyed. Israel plundered only the cattle and spoil of that city for themselves, according to the Lord's command that he had given Joshua. Dr. Olson had three S's, salvation, surrender, service. Joshua has four S's in, uh, in this section, swindle, signal, smoke, and sprung trap. First, swindle. Joshua swindles the kings of Ai and Bethel. He falls backwards, getting these overexcited enemy troops to pursue him down into the wadi. This is perfectly executed. Um, don't, don't be thrown by all the numbers here. Let me just walk you through it. So he sent first the group that, that came up and, and hid out here. We don't know where, but if you see the dark color there, that tells you how steep these hills are. In fact, you can see it. The main highway is right here. When you drive past it in Israel today, you can see how steep this is. They were back here hidden. Uh, in those defiles. Joshua comes up with the troops. He's right here. He comes out and dances in front of the city of Ai. Woohoo! Oh, we're so scared. And then he turns and he runs away like this. Uh, by the way, here's his screening force that was up here to protect his flank. He runs away. When he does, the king of Ai, who had come out to take the high ground, pursues him down into the wadi. And then Joshua gives the signal. These guys come up. They capture Ai and burn it. When they see that signal, Israel turns. They do a quick about and they're driving them back this way. The group comes out of the city, which was very quick and easy to take, and they then trap, and uh, they, they lick the men of Ai and Bethel like the middle of an Oreo cookie. All right, I need, a, I need a volunteer from the audience. Come here, Mikey, you're hired. Come on up. All right. Um, there was one of my favorite moves in wrestling uh, was based on this same principle. You get the other person to overcommit, and then suddenly you show up behind them, okay? It's called a duck under. It worked like this. I would tie up with somebody like that, all right? And boy, your hair would, couldn't be that long in a wrestling tournament. You know, I would have, you can't touch your collar because other people's fingers get caught and broken. And I would have boys that would not believe me. And then we would go to tournaments and they would say, oh no, my hair's okay. And the ref would say, got to cut your hair. And I had tape scissors that I kept specifically for that purpose to teach them that I meant it when I said your hair should be cut, and I would cut their hair. Do you know what it's like to have your hair cut with tape scissors? It's got tape sticky all over. It just basically pulls the hair out. It was awesome. Anyway, um, sorry, that was free. Okay, so I would tie up like this. So put your right hand on my head. So the guy would tie up as well. So he would grab my head, go and grab my left elbow. There you go. So he'd tie up like this, and you're trying to control the other guy. Now, when he ties up, he would always put a little pressure on my head. He would pull down. So pull down like that. Now, what I would do is I would pull back against him. The reason I would pull back against him is what? What, what happens when I pull back against his pressure? What is he always going to do? He's going to pull harder, right? Uh, Newton was correct in, in wrestling as well as physics. Every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Okay, so when, when, when he pulls down, I pull back against him and he pulls harder. And when he does, I just use his momentum and I come up behind him and then I've got him, okay? You see, all I do is I use his own momentum against him. Let's do it again, okay? So he's gonna, he's gonna pull down and when he pulls down on my head, I just move his elbow just a little and I just slip right through. So he pulls down and then suddenly I'm behind him like that. Give Mikey a hand, that was awesome, thank you. All right. And speaking of mics, we undid mine. All right. Israel does that same swindle. Just all of a sudden, this king of Ai looks up, and the enemy is behind him. Now, the signal he uses is really interesting. I want you to look up here at the slide. This is a, this is a relief. It's from a very famous Near Eastern War. It's fought uh, hundreds of years before Joshua. And I want you to look at the king. Um, the king here, he appears twice. Here's the king once on the top of the relief. Here he is on the bottom of the relief. There's his, his face right there. And uh, if you see right here, there's an interesting little short curved sword that he has. That's a bakidan. A bakidan was a very particular instrument. This is the closest thing that I own. Um, bakidan would have been curved like this, but it would have been about a foot longer than this one. My son... <laughs> My son bought this from some Bedouins when we were in Jordan one time and I was teaching and he actually nearly caused an international incident because he's such a good bargainer, he kept driving the guy down past the point of respectability. Anyway, it's, it's okay, we got out alive. But, uh, but he ended up with this, uh, this cool little bakidan. This is a little ceremonial knife. And uh, can you see, do you see the signal on that? 
Does it shine at all? I can't tell in the lights. So, so that would be real shiny. So it's a shiny thing that he's using, and that's a bakidon. That is the exact same word that appears in our text. If you, if you look here, it says uh, in, in 118, bakidon. Now, not knowing how to translate that, most English Bibles render it javelin, and it's really unfortunate we don't have any kind of word for this type of special signal knife because uh, javelin makes it sound to our ears like Joshua's holding up a spear, and, and this is not hanit, this is not spear in Hebrew, it's bakidon. Joshua, just like that Sumerian king long, long before him, uses his bakidon to signal his troops, and this is key. A critical part of an ambush is knowing when to spring the trap. I know. That brings up the question you're asking in your Sun Tzu imitation, how did Joshua know when to signal? Great question. Thank you, General. Um, the hardest part of this maneuver will be the timing. Remember, Joshua's down in the wadi. These guys are not only up high, they're on the back side. There's no way they can see him. There's no way Joshua can even see that well the, the people from Ai. How does he know when the God-haters have, have come far enough out of their city so that the Hebrews could rise up behind him? God told him. It was divine assistance. Look at verse 18 and 19. The Lord said to Joshua, hold out the bakidon in your hand toward I. Right? God was, was guiding there so that Joshua knew just when to strike back. And God's guidance includes a really delightful play on words. I want to, I want to show you this. this. This play on words is to emphasize God's presence and his sovereignty. God says, raise the bakidon in your hand. That prepositional phrase, in your hand, is biyadcha in Hebrew. Joshua is, is to participate. He's to keep his hand raised, just like Moses did against the Amalekites uh, a generation before. But the battle belongs to the Lord. God uses a, a form of that same word as the main verb here to emphasize that. The city I will hand, Beyadka, as you take the bakidan in your hand. God is in charge and you get to partner with him. That's really well done. Verse 21 is the climax. When Joshua and all Israel saw the men in ambush had captured the city, here's our next signal. The smoke was rising from it. That's when they did their duck under. They turned back around and struck down the men of Ai. And that takes us to our third S, which is smoke. But wait, 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 just wait a minute, you're thinking in your Sumerian warlord imitation, which we all know translates as, how could Joshua have gotten a signal to the ambushing troops? I don't care how flashy his little knife was. How could he have gotten that to the troops? God told him when to do it, but how did they even see it? The ambushers were all behind the hills to the west. That is an excellent question. Now, it could be that this, the answer is, is divine provision, and, and that could be another miracle. God told him, and God may have told them. But again, the text tells us when there are supernatural events. So most likely, it was more of a normal warfare tactic, and that would have been smoke. In those parts of the world, especially just to the east of this area and the countries we now call Iraq and Iran, smoke was a very, very important part of large battles, okay? Listen, the battle for Ai occurred early in the morning, okay? So Joshua, holding his bakidon, looking to the west, it would have flashed in the sun like that. Couldn't have been seen by people on the other side because the sun is, is in the east. It's behind him. But it certainly could have been seen by people who were up on these hills. He had a force of 5,000 people right up here. If a couple of guys went to each of these hills, by the way, these hills are over 3,000 feet high. If a couple of guys went to those hills, as soon as they saw the flash, they could have lit the beacon fires of Gondor, right? I, I mean, they could have <laughs> lit the, uh, the beacon fires that they had up there on top of the hills, now, those fires would have been easily seen by the large ambush force, and they would have known to come out. And then once they burn eye, that becomes smoke again, the signal for Joshua to turn around and to do his attack. Smoke is a very powerful symbol here because it pictures the completion of God's word to Abraham. 500 years before this, God told Abraham that one day the sins of the Amorites would be full, that they would reject Yahweh one last time, and, and he would wipe out their towns. For this generation from Ai and Bethel, that smoke symbolizes a sprung trap. Go back to verse 22. Then the men in ambush came out of the city against them. The men of Ai were trapped between the Israelite forces, some on one side, some on the other. They struck them down until no survivor or fugitive remained. But they captured the king of Ai alive and brought him to Joshua. Surprise, surprise, surprise. The hunters become the hunted. The main force, now bolstered by the reserve coming out of Ai, surges back west. They move in together, and again, they lick Ai like the middle of an Oreo cookie, all right? 
And as commanded, Joshua keeps his hand up until every last one is destroyed. Then God gives a new reminder. Go to verse 28. Joshua burned Ai and left it a permanent ruin, still desolate today. He hung the body of the king of Ai on a tree until evening. And at sunset, Joshua commanded they take his body down from the tree. They threw it down at the entrance of the city gate and put a large pile of rocks over it, which remains today. So, the captured king of Ai gets his due for rejecting Yahweh and opposing Israel. But if we really want to understand how this plays out, we need to go back to to Moses' law. Go go back just a few pages in your Bible, if you would, to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 21. It's it's just a few pages back to the West. Deuteronomy 21, um, this is the, the restatement of Moses' law, verse 22. If anyone is found guilty of an offense deserving the death penalty and is executed, and you hang his body on a tree, you're not to leave his corpse on the tree overnight, but are to bury him that day. For anyone hung on a tree is under God's curse. You must not defile the land your God is giving you as an inheritance. Now look at the lessons here. First, the one hung as capital punishment should be buried, not left hanging around. This is singular. I can't find any other command like this anywhere in the ancient world. You always left the bodies hanging around, the hanging tree. You left the bodies hanging around because that was a warning to other people. That's what all other people did. God says, no, no, even the cursed criminal is to be treated humanely. Second, everyone hung on a tree takes a what, everybody? A curse. And third, the land is God's gift and it's not to be cursed. It's not to be made dirty. Knowing that law, Joshua has this offender cut down and buried under a pile of stones. Now, probably the, the pagan was buried um, in a, a, a tomb like this one. Uh, this is a picture Janet took in Wales, actually. But, um, but you would have, you would have uh, taken a notch in the land and, and then put the body in there and then you cover the whole thing over with a whole bunch of stones. They would have had many of these kind of barrows uh, because of the thousands of bodies in the field. The stones there become a new reminder from God. If you, if you studied chapter 7 with me, you know we saw a pile of stones there. That was a sad memorial. It was a pile of stones heaped over a traitor. This pile of stones has a totally different meaning. These stones are a reminder of victory. They're a reminder of blessing, not of disobedience and defeat. Please catch the difference. These stones represent the salvation of God's people who are surrendered to His service. Their enemy is defeated. And that has a direct bearing on our grasp of the New Testament. What did Deuteronomy say about the person who hung on a tree? He is what? He's cursed. Who took a curse for you? Who hung on the tree for you? Jesus. And He was buried in a stone tomb like this one. He was put in a tomb in the ground with a rock closed over it. Did he stay in that tomb? Yes or no? No, he did not. He rose from the dead. He is alive. So that tomb, that pile of rocks becomes what for you and for me? Becomes a beautiful symbol of salvation. The reality that our enemy, Satan, did not win. He is defeated. God did a duck under against him and conquered death. And because of this new reminder from the Lord, you and I and all who trust in Jesus can live in joyful surrender to God. We can serve God effectively because our enemy is beaten and our souls are saved by God's victory. Amen? Amen. Look, friends, all this new stuff, all this new stuff in chapter 8, the new beginning for Israel, the new strategy, the new victory, the new reminder, it all has one big idea. The big idea is salvation comes from trusting God. The, The... The new stuff is designed to impress upon us the old lesson that everybody who trusts God is saved by His amazing power and grace. And what are we saved to? Surrender and service. Dr. Olson was spot on. Salvation should lead to surrender for service. Pray with me. Let's pray together. Father, I want to pray first of all for anyone, anyone wherever they may be that is studying the Bible with me today. Thank you. Thank you for the joy of getting to learn together. But I pray for anyone who is not a believer in Jesus, that they will trust you right now. You and I deserve to be buried under those rocks. We are sinful. We are, by nature, enemies of God who is holy. And yet God has completely switched things up God himself, the Son, Jesus, came to earth and died on the cross, and then he rose from that tomb so that if we trust him, we have everlasting life. If you've never done so, trust Jesus right now. Believe in him. 
for salvation. And let's discuss surrender. I got, a, I got a great note. Lord, I got a great note this week from my friend Martin. He wrote me and said, Wayne, one of man's chief liabilities is our predilection towards self-reliance. Faith does not come easily to us. We continually have to be checking and realigning ourselves to God and his ways and his plan. Lord, I pray that I will and my brothers and sisters will surrender to you today. And Father, I pray for our service. I, I thank you for, in, in, in our particular country, our upcoming Memorial Day celebration where there are stones, in this case headstones, that represent ultimate service. And I pray that we may serve like that. I, I pray that we get up and go. In Jesus' name, amen.